So I'm a um, computer scientist by trade. I've forgotten all my programming. I haven't actually programmed anything of any particular note for probably 10 years. Um, I ran a company, started a company in Cambridge called Microrobotics that did process control instrumentation type stuff in the late 80s. Um, and then I got into transport about 20 years ago um, because it was, transport's a process control problem. It's more, it's bigger. Um, transport is 15% of personal expenditure in the UK. It's more than tra it's more than housing and it's more than eating, more than food. Um, and 10% of personal expenditure in the UK is um, the car. Um, I went into this because I thought information technology might change it. And I think right now, in these few years, um, we're right in the epicenter of a big change in how people are traveling. Um, and information technology is at the middle of it. I'm going to talk about a thing called Conga, which used to be called Coach Train, um, except Coach is a really naff way of traveling if you're an American in an aeroplane. Um, and Coach and Train are both sporting, have a sporting connotation, so Coach Train was really just not something to call a project. Um, Conga is a dance where people join and split when they feel like it, so that seemed like a nice idea. But I'm going to go back um, 200 years um, because there are a few interesting change to times when transport has changed in a big, huge, epic way. And um, I think that gives you a clue as to how change happens and how fast it happens. So for sort of time immemorial, if you wanted to get around, you needed one of these. This is an 18th century horse whip, I'm told. I'm not an expert on the subject. Um, you also needed a horse, and the horse needed some hay. And everything that happened in England and around you know, the, the, the Western world um, happened because um, it could be done on the horse and there was a whole economy supporting the horse. The wheelwrights, the blacksmiths, uh, the coaching inns, um, uh, all of those and the turnpike roads and things. Um, and then suddenly, you know, all of a sudden, um, we had the railways arrived. And the railways arrived at about the time that we built our Victorian cities and probably our Victorian cities couldn't have been built without the railways. They brought the food, and we escaped from the Victorian cities to get out to the seaside, to the, to the railway um, um, resorts. Um, and if you look at your Bradshaws from 1922, you could discover you could get to, from Liverpool Street, you could get to Cromer three, only three minutes slower than you can today. Um, <laughs> that's because today it goes into Norwich and changes, whereas before it filled up with people going to Cromer got up to speed and didn't stop until it got to Cromer. Um, but fortunes were made and fortunes were lost um, in the process of building the railways. Um, a guy called George Hudson who was called the Railway King. Um, he put together a lot of the early financial packages and financial arrangements and um, investments in the railway mania for building the railways. Um, he ended up um, fle fleeing the country to avoid his creditors. And there's a theme coming here, by the way. Um, you, 20 years later, you've got the bicycle. And about 12 years after that, the first omnibus, the first um, petrol pad bus arrived in London. Um, 12 years later, the last horse bus ran in London. It took 12 years for horse buses. People stopped traveling on horse buses. People stopped investing in horse bus companies. They started getting into trouble. No one would bail them out. People were putting money into these. Um, so, you know, so again, there is a, um, and John Hertz is an amazing guy who actually built a lot of the early um, buses and decided that taxis should be yellow as well as building the Hertz rent-a-car business. And then sort of from the 30s, cars began to dominate our cities. In the 60s, we ripped, them all, all, ripped all our cities up and um, to try and accommodate the car, which was never going to work. We knew that in the 60s. They just take too much space. Um, we also built the interurban um, road system, um, the, the motorway system. The Minister of Transport was Ernest Marples. Ernest Marples uh, appointed um, Beeching, who cut the railways, which were in big trouble. Um, by the way, the turnpikes, which had operated for 200 years, being paid by fees, paid by people who wanted to travel on roads, collapsed within 20 years of the first railway. Um, the railways collapsed within 20 years 
of the coming of, of, of the car. Um, Ernest Marples also, he, left, he, he fled the country at 48 hours notice to Monaco when his tax affairs were being investigated later in life, leaving his, Man um, his Mayfair flat covered in bits of paper and so, as in the panic that he left. So there's a sort of theme that there's you know, huge investments, um, but there's also, I don't know, slightly dodgy, um, slightly on the edge business, shall we say. Um, when I came here today, I left my house in Ipswich, diddle 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 on my back down to the railway station, railway station to, to railway station here, diddle diddle up the hill. Every single piece of infrastructure I used was built in the Victorian times and hasn't really changed. So anyone who has a new idea about um, transport and says the first thing we're going to need to do is to build a whole load new in, of, of new infrastructure um, isn't going to get anywhere. I mean, high speed two is a railway between London and Birmingham. It's not actually that difficult. But you look how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost and how difficult it is. Now we've got a really developed um, and rich country where... It's, become, it's becoming really, really difficult to build new infrastructure. We've got infrastructure. We've got railway lines and roads. Sometimes they change their purpose. My favorite was to discover a canal which had been turned into a railway. Nice and flat. The, the canals collapsed when the railways came, by the way. Then the railways collapsed and it got turned into a cycleway. And now they want to turn it back into a railway. <laughs> so things can change their uses. Um, um, Roads can become pedestrianised, um, and you know, but but to create a new way and and to rip up all the, and and to reallocate the land that's that's very unlikely to happen. So any new change now probably has to work on the existing infrastructure. Um, look at that! Did you see that? <coughs> he started with a bike in the eighteen or when? How old? What, what what period is he? In nineteen hundred. Anyway, he started with a bicycle about 1900. He's got the most new, fancy bike you can have, and it looks almost exactly the same as his previous one. Just to, again, in case you missed it. Um, bicycles really... Oh, hang on. No, 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 no. You want them to go on. Um, our devices, our cars, our bicycles, our trams, our trains, um, really would be recognisable someone from 100 years ago from, you know, from, from, from further back than that. Um, we might get new vehicles, but generally, I, I think we're probably not. But what is changing is that they're getting an information technology makeover. So this is um, Velib in Paris. It was the first successful large bike share scheme. Um, and that was in 2007. I think it's hugely successful. And Paris is now saying they want to get to basically get cars out of Paris. And Paris used to be a city of cars, didn't it? It used to be cars all the way down the road. They're just saying they don't really have a place. And Velib is seen as an extension of the metro system. So you'll often have it by the metro. You'll do the metro, and then you'll do the next bit. So we're talking about daisy-chaining journeys, but you don't have to take a bicycle on the metro. There are now a million bike share bikes in the world available from 40,000 bike shares, uh, 40,000 stations like this in 700, 714 cities around the world, according to Wikipedia. Um, you know, there, are, there are actually 90,000 avail bikes available from one Chinese city. Um, but the point is, from 2007 to now, you've gone, you've, it, it's gone that fast, and it, it, it's on an exponential. Um, so information technology hasn't changed the device. We still use the same roads. We still use the same bikes. But suddenly they are part of a multimodal transport network rather than the thing you have to use for end-to-end -end journeys, keep, and then use to take back. Um, a similar thing has happened with cars. Um, in, two, in year 2000, Zipcar started, Flexcar started, which was the major competitor to Zipcar until Zipcar bought them, and City Car Club started, which was the car club operator here. I don't think they are the car club operator in Norwich now. Is that right? I think it might have changed. Um, there's, there's a car club, but I'm not sure it's City Car Club. I'm not sure that City Car Club are still operating in, in Norwich. 
Anyway, um, Zipcar got bought by Avis for half a billion dollars. Um, City Car Club got bought by Enterprise last week. Um, two weeks ago, I was very pleased because I was a shareholder of it, having um, taken a bit of a risk a few years ago that felt a bit risky. But the point is, what they've done is they've turned a car from being a personal thing that's mine. I might use it for an hour a day if, I, if I'm quite, you know, <coughs> I use a car a lot. Um, and I might, there might probably be one person in it. It's now become something that will be used by multiple people a day. Um, there are 1.6 million car club members. There's a billion pound revenue per year. It's expected to grow to 6 billion by 2020. That's an industry that didn't exist in the year 2000. Um, Blah Blah Car is one of the biggest rideshare um, companies in the world. Um, I mean, Liftshare is, is the local version. Um, are you from? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. um, Blah Blah Car was started in 2006. They've got 10 million members in 14 countries. Um, I think Robin Chase from Zipcar was, who started Zipcar, was also, she seems to also be involved in Blah Blah Car. Um, they had an interesting story. A judge in France was um, a member of Blah Blah Car, took someone while he was coming into town, was chatting away with someone else in the car, only to discover that the person in the back was the person he was going to be judging, and the trial had to be abandoned. But other than that, it's a good idea. Um, don't you love Uber? Can't you think of, isn't it anything worse than that image as a promotion <laughs> for car sharing? Doesn't that feel sinister to you? <laughs> Honestly, you know, this is a country, this is in a company that uh, minicabs, sexual harassment, all sorts of rape, God's sake. That just feel, I don't know, we, we just, we, I was just looking at Uber's branding and I couldn't think of anything more masculine and more sort of almost sinister than that. Um, but obviously it works. They were founded in 2009, they're worth $40 billion. They make $1 billion revenue from nine cities in the States. They make, 28, they make $18 million from San Francisco a month. Now, they do pay the drivers. <laughs> so not all of that is, revenue, is profit. They take all the money and they pass us a percentage on. But knowing how these tech companies work, it probably isn't 99.9%. .9%. So they are hugely profitable and they're basically taking the taxi industry apart across the world. That's an industry which is in a, a, a license plate in New York costs a million dollars. Um, they're bought by companies, they're not bought by individuals anymore. Uber now has more drivers in New York than there are license holders. You can imagine there are some very pissed off people. Um, they're, they're not doing as many miles, but the point is this, is, this started with an app and then the drivers become part of the app, as it were, rather than um, when the black cabs in London had a protest against Uber. Uber had its best, best day ever, and on that day it announced that you could book a black cab through Uber. You know, they employ the public affairs guy from the Obama campaign. Um, these guys are are hugely ambitious, hugely resourced, just like the railway tycoons were, just like um, the tycoons um, um, in, you know, it, around the automobiles were. The good old bus. Um, bus rapid transit. Bus rapid transit is basically, it's been described as surface subway. So you pay on the turnstile as you come in, and then when the bus arrives, lots of doors open, you get on, lots of doors close, and you go. And the idea is that you, the dwell time at a stop will be in, measured in seconds. Um, and this is, in, this is a system in, in China. Um, I went to the, see the one in um, Istanbul. There, were, there was a bus with 250 people every 14 seconds. That is the highest throughput you can get on a, a 10 foot wide strip of rail or tarmac in the world. It's, that's, far, that's more throughput than you get from um, a metro system or from a rail system because they can travel really quite close together. Um, and I think it's the same throughput as a 20 or 30 lane in each direction road. 
So the first big system was in Bogota in 2000. There are now 186 cities with bus rapid transit system that move 31 million people a day. So again, all of this has happened you know, while we've been eating lunch sort of thing. Um, another interesting thing is that, I mean, our roads are sort of really a tragedy of the commons. Um, they're free, everyone goes out and uses them and then they're all full up and everyone complains that they're all full up just like everyone put their cars and cows on the, on the grass and then all the grass gets eaten. Um, congestion charging, um, it was 2003 that it came in, in London. Um, in 2000, America started investing in high occupancy toll lanes where you pay a variable fee depending on how fast the high occupancy lane is, how busy it is, and they push the price up as it gets more the more demand in order to keep the throughput. Suddenly, after 100 years of not having charging for road users since the turnpikes collapsed, we're starting to get road pricing coming back. And actually, it works. It actually means that you can move. And although um, it's, um, no politician will dare talk about it at the moment, um, <coughs> if you want a city that works, you should probably put in road pricing because it then means that people when you do want to move, you pay your money, but you actually move. Um, I worked for a public transport company. My boss was wanting to move, go from High Wycombe to a meeting at the Department for Transport to Cambridge, which is where our other office was. And I heard the other guy say, no, it's easy. The congestion starts coming. You just drive straight into London. You park in NCP car park next to the highway at Department of Transport. They have knocked down their prices by the amount of the congestion charge. They pay the congestion charge for you. And then you drive straight out to Cambridge. It actually meant that for someone who was you know, prepared to pay seven pounds or something, suddenly London was moving again. And the amount of mileage driven in London has halved since 1995, since before, it was falling before the congestion charge came in. So we're seeing charging coming back for roads, and I think that's gonna grow more. So you take, you take charging for roads Repurposing a road space, this actually I took the slide out, it's Paris Plage, um, they turn, turn, turn a road beside the Seine in, the, in August into a beach um, and they have huge numbers of people coming to it. Um, most people leave Paris in August because it's too hot, so why didn't you go and stay in Paris and sunbathe on a dual carriageway? Um, <laughs> Which is what they do, and, you know, and, and it's called the Paris Plage. Um, it's hugely successful. Then you have your docking stations, which you build for your cars and your bikes, and then people are walking using journey planning off this. You've got Uber hidden behind there. You've got a zip car, and this has become your car keys. You don't longer have a car. You no longer have any car keys. The car keys are in the zip car, which you, or your city car club car, which you, which you retrieve when you get in the car. What happens if your battery runs out? On your, on your smartphone, you bug it. You bug it. <laughs> Someone had better build a better, better battery, which, which they're working at very hard. Um, so that's really, and this is called intelligent mobility. It's called um, transport, as a, um, transport as a service. Um, um, and, um, sorry, the software as a service, mo mobility as a service. Um, transport as a service. Mo mobility is a, the, the terminology is still in flux. So we've talked about um, sharing cars, we've talked about better buses, we've talked about ride sharing and things a bit like taxis and a bit like ride sharing, talk about walking. But I was interested in, in, in interurban travel. Um, I, I moved to Ipswich um, um, 10 years ago and Sometimes I need to go to Birmingham. There are things that happen in Birmingham. Birmingham is a quite important city. Um, and there were three ways I could... No, I won't do that. Um, no, I will do that. Um, there, were, there are three ways I can get to Birmingham from Ipswich. I can drive, and the A14 is very busy, and they're going to spend billions of pounds making it um, still work while it's busy. I can take a train to London and back out to Birmingham, which average is um, 38 miles an hour even though I'm rushing into London, rushing out again, compared to the crow's flight, I'm doing 38 miles an hour. Or I can take a, ho a coach, and I might as well slip my wrists, because the recommended route goes via Victoria Coach Station, and it averages 20 miles an hour. So what I was interested in was how one can make interurban travel work better. 
And we've got roads. We built our roads in the 1960s. Ernest Minus Marples did that before he went and disappeared to Monaco. Um, but they were built for roads. And if you were building them in public transport, you would do them slightly differently, but that's too late. And, and America did the same, Germany did the same. So it's not, not, it's not just us. And then in June last year, I came up with this idea of what if coaches were able to dock end to end while in motion on the strategic road network and transfer passengers. Because one of the big problems on public transport is I want to go from here to there and I don't want to stop. I want to go as fast as possible. But the person sitting next to me wants to get off there and someone else wants to get on there and someone else wants to get on there. And you end up stopping all the time, which makes it really slow. So if you could transfer people around and also interchanges can get very big and complicated with escalators and lifts. They get very expensive and they get very difficult to make, um, to navigate and they become really difficult if you have any disability or a physical impairment. Um, so the idea that these, these vehicles come together and you can just move backwards and forwards seemed quite attractive. And it's an idea which have, hasn't sort of really gone away. These vehicles operate every few minutes along the strategic road network. If you have a train, it's got a thousand seats you operate a service every half an hour. That's 2,000 people an hour you can move, which is quite a lot. Um, but um, if you do that by coaches, you would have those as 20 coaches with 50 seats. So rather than a 30 minute service, it's now a sort of two minute service. So it's a turn up and go thing, which is quite attractive. Feeder vehicles serve the urban areas and join on with these vehicles, mobile docking between them and Conservatively, it is, oh, I meant to change that. Um, it's a billion pound annual of um, in the UK alone, and that's profit. Um, it's about a 1.7 billion pound revenue. And if 20% of drivers on the strategic road network making long distance journeys chose to use this, as many people would use this as use the national rail system. And it would mean that we wouldn't need to spend 15 billion pounds widening our road network, and that would mean we'd be able to have a health system, etc. Um, no T-tools, no stopping, frequent service. Similar traveling travel times to driving, you're not stopping, therefore you should be getting there, but you can, um, you can work and rest and sleep and mess around with Facebook and smartphones and things while you're on the travel. Um, looking at the pricing of that's what it costs to drive, some discounts for volume and things, those are the sorts of costs it would be for journeys which are pretty competitive um, compared to other public transport operation. Um, it's a global market um, because any sort of westernized developed country has created the same infrastructure around the car. Um, it's, it, it's probably got a 20... Uh, uh, five to one saving of CO2 and energy because you're getting people in the same vehicle. So at the moment I'm doing the sort of proof of concept, proof of market, <coughs> prototyping simulation. I'm also doing the coalition building, building networking. Really interested in what your thoughts are on this, whether you think I'm mad and should go home um, or which, whether we should get on and do it. Um, there are four people who I would like to take an interest in this. One is called Elon. Anyone know his surname? Musk. Musk. Sergey. Bryn. Bryn. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> yeah. Those those people, if you read what they say, they are seriously interested. And Larry Page. Um, they're seriously interested in transport. They get this. They have seen the ridiculousness of everyone having a metal box and leaving it lying around. Um, you know, if we had all arrived in separate metal boxes, imagine how big the car park is that would require for this one room. Um, I'm building this as an open source thing. This is a not for profit. I'm, I'm building, I'm starting a um, not for profit company, trying to get registered as a charity, trying to get some funding um, from sort of those sort of people to kick the ideas around to get to the point that um, an Elon or a Sergey or a Richard or a Larry or anyone else who might pop up um, would be interested. Um, just before, I, f I think that's the last one. Yeah. Um, so just, 
Oh, that's, um, that's all my tweeteroonie. Is there anything embarrassing there? No, this is the sort of thing. I'm Peter Easton. This is the sort of thing I tweet about. Um, that was an interesting graph. Um, age of driver and likelihood of killing people. <laughs> it's really good that not many 17-year-olds are learning to drive. Um, that's probably a message that at about 70 we should probably think of something else. Um, but luckily, millennials are not learning to drive cars. They're not buying cars. Dr buying cars is becoming a thing that you do um, when you um, start a family, not when you get to 17. Um, yeah, I, all sorts of... Um, I, I generally am interested in the sort of politics of transport. So the vehicles I'm thinking of are take a coach, take the luggage compartment out because you don't need it because people are going to manage their own luggage, bring it down so that it's a low floor vehicle so that the guy in his Mercedes who's driving home on a Friday evening with his smartphone and there's something he wants to look at and he's feeling sleepy, he looks across at someone exactly like him sitting in a car, snoozing, or doing his email. It mustn't look like a coach, otherwise people will feel like losers. Um, <laughs> so, challenges. Um, you can drive these vehicles anywhere on the strategic road network. They can make any decision of turning at any junction from the A14 onto the A11, from the A14 onto the A1, onto the M M1, onto the M6. Um, any of these vehicles can go into any town. Any vehicle could join onto any vehicle as long as it's, you're not actually at a junction. Any passenger can be asked to move, but you can't move all the passengers at the same time from one vehicle to another because that would be stupid and they'd all crash. And um, So there's a logistics problem of how do you choose who to put in which vehicle. You also want to assemble people into vehicles Ideally, you know, if you're coming out of Norwich, you'd have a mixture of people who are all wanting to go down the A11. But you'd then start, hopefully, you'd end up with people who wanted to go onto the A14 and went down the A11. And then you might start putting people together with people who come from Ipswich who wanted to go to Manchester or wanted to go up the M6. You'd start to assemble people into vehicles. And eventually, you'd have 50 people who wanted to go to Manchester or wanted to go to Liverpool. And then you just drive there because you don't need to do any more fiddling around. So there's a sort of artificial intelligence problem there. You've also got the actual docking problem, um, the actual sort of, you know, which I think is quite simple, because you've got some steering, which you've got to get right, and you've got some acceleration that you've got to get right. Um, yeah, anyway, that's... That. Sorry? <laughs> he's, um, did you see that his... Have you, have you Elon Musk, SpaceX, and his um, first oh, stage rockets? Who... who, who, who So who knows what Elon Musk and SpaceX nearly achieved yesterday? OK. Um, space, Elon Musk started pay, uh, PayPal. He was, uh, he was right in, uh, um, made a whole load of money. Sorry? Um, he then started Tesla. He then started SpaceX. He then started Solar, Solar City. Um, Tesla does electric cars. SpaceX built space rockets. Solar City is the largest supplier of solar electricity in the States. Um, he's a phenomenal guy. Um, SpaceX, he describes taking a disposable rocket and sending it into space and dumping the first stage and the second stage into the sea as being like going to the shops in a Mercedes and blowing it up. Um, he says the 1% of the cost of sending a rocket into space is the fuel, 99% is the equipment. Um, is, is the machinery. Um, so if you can bring the machinery back, and he had the mad idea, which nearly worked 12 hours ago, but not quite, and nearly worked in January, but not quite, take a first stage rocket that's servicing the International Space Station, deliver a ton of material to the International Space Station, when the first stage rocket is doing a mile a second up at 80,000 feet, 100,000 feet, something like that, bloody high, it detaches, it then puts some rocket, slows itself down, comes down, gets itself vertical, and lands on a 300-foot-long barge in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> now, he nearly, it nearly worked. And they thought they were going to get it right, but something went slightly wrong. Uh, 
Sorry? A sticky valve. It was something sticky last time, wasn't it? Okay. Um, the the the, bar, the drone, which is an un, unmanned barge, because this thing might come in at some high speed, um, is called read the instructions. <laughs> Sorry? Just, Just read the instructions. It's, it's the name of the ship out of one of the torture Okay. The one on the other coast going to be called, of course, I still love you. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so that's, that's the idea. Um, this is a billion pound opportunity. Transport is up for change. I think that the era of people having private cars and driving, expecting to be able to drive them on their own in cities, producing pollution and then park them and come back later and leave them on a pavement if, if they had to because there was nowhere else to park. I think those are, those are nearly over in the same way that um, smoking in enclosed spaces was nearly over in the 1980s. I think in due course you won't, it just won't be socially acceptable, won't be allowed to do that. Um, but the coach, coach train, um, Conga. So you in this team it would be like Hong Kong, so if you be in Hong Kong, it's like stoke the open, like a tube. Sorry? In Hong Kong, a tube, you basically walk. Well, I mean, clearly... In between the carriages. Well, yeah. clearly, when the things are separated, it's got to look like a coach, and it's got to have a windscreen. Yeah. So and then when it joins... In Tree Tay, you're going to get the people to move on cue, and you're going to play, you know, let's all do the conga or something, and move, like, musical chairs around you. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I mean, things like that, it's a, I'm telling a bit of a joke, but we used music in, our, um, in the retail business to get people... We changed the music to get people to move faster and to use the service okay. faster. And you can... Yeah, there's all kinds of ways you can corral people. Yeah. I mean, if you look at a, a modern urban bus, low floor bus, which is probably the sort of thing one we're looking at, there's actually quite a width because it's the entrance that you're coming in at, and the driver is actually tucked away quite at the side. There is quite a width to get people through because you probably need to get someone with a wheelchair through. Um, how you organise it, I don't know. We're going to have to do some software simulation. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to do some guys with the robotics and AI guys down at Essex who have got who are very good on this. Um, but the whole social aspect of will you feel comfortable doing it? I mean, you know, you have to do mobile docking because you can't stop on a motorway safely, and there are no there's no infrastructure on the motorway where you can pull over and say. Can you, can you exchange passages? It would be easier, technically, to build some infrastructure. But try and getting that through planning and trying to get that to happen, it's not going to happen. It's so, 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 insurance, you know, insurance <coughs> for the docking process are going to be the challenge. I, I don't think also, if it were me, um, I can't see that if you are proposing as a charity, as your organisation, to explore it, can't see anyone investing. Um, there are a lot, lot of very it's rich people. Risky, isn't it? um, it's very, very cheap to do the simulation. We're talking about 100, 200, 300,000 pounds. But then you develop the technology and um, the idea, what, what This is the pre competitive stage. I've spoken to investors. I actually spoke to a VC investor standing in that um, churchyard um, before I came to, to sink the city. Um, and we have agreed with them that it's not ready for risk investment on a commercial basis. Um, but there are significant funds who want to deal with climate change and deal with environmental issues and social issues. Um, so I'm confident that um, there will be grant funding. What you're trying to do is to knock enough of the uncertainty off so that uh, an investor can come in. And as soon as an investor comes in, they can treat things as private as they like. But what we're doing, what I'm doing, is getting the idea out there, getting some basic statistics and information together, which allows someone to make a commercial judgment as to whether they want to put $50 million into it. Isn't the, isn't the biggest problem really about routing and the, and the, the road networks? I mean, for this scheme to work, you need, you need you know, the route, the route you need bits of route running parallel. You can't you can't have a a, a vehicle that's you know if you go from here and start heading towards Cambridge and you're going down the upper level, 
you want to, you, well, actually, this is not a good example because there is some part of this road runs parallel on the A40 now there. But generally, a road junction, you know, two roads cross, don't they? But to be clear, you, you would get, if you were wanting to go south out of, out of Norwich, you'd get on the first vehicle that you were told to, which probably would be the first vehicle, you'd go down the A11. Yeah. Okay. By the time you got to the A14, one, two vehicles would join, one of which was going to go the A14 east and one of which was going to do the A, A11 south, and they would play hokey-cokey, slowing down, speeding up, in order to join, to be able to transfer. So if you were in if, if you were in one which was going to go down the A11, you'd be moved forward and you'd end up asked to move forward and you'd end up in one going to the A14. And if you and, and vice versa. And then you're in one going the A14. Where, that, where do those two vehicles both come from? Those two vehicles have both come from Norwich in the first place. Uh, well, Norwich is possibly, I mean, if you were talking about the, on the A14, one of them might have come from Ipswich, or it might have come from Norwich, or it might have come from Colchester, um, or down, you know, down from, um, by the time you get into the Midlands, you know, the one on the A14 might have come from the A1, might have come from the M11, might have come from the A14. So we're, we're slightly at the fringes I of just the think network. That, you know, for the docking and the exchange of passengers, you know, going at, going at speed, you're just going to take some time. You're going to travel several miles, mm. and, and generally routes don't have several miles of, of common. There's a part as well is the, the congestion on the roads, which is part of the problem you're trying to solve. So you've got two vehicles trying to join together, but there's the <coughs> first one leaves, and then there's an accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, look, look. I, I, no, 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 no. At, I, at, I, at this point, one doesn't have answers to all no, the questions. Absolutely. This guy behind is. You seem to be assuming these vehicles are docking end to end. Yes. Is this an artifact of you thinking in terms of the only part of the country that doesn't have any three lane motorways? <laughs> I think it would be much easier to have a vehicle which is legal now as two separate vehicles and is legal when joined because you can have articulated buses up to quite a long length. I think trying to get the Daily Mail to agree. <laughs> that buses drop adjoining side by side, taking up two lanes of a three-lane motorway. I think that isn't going to happen. I think these two problems I can solve. I think I, I think I think I think there will be a solution. Um, you might not always be able to run the network exactly where you want because it might be annoyingly close between Cambridge and between Newmarket and Cambridge or something. You might not or Norwich, the A11 coming into the A14 and the A11. Going out of the A14 might be too close for you to do some docking arrangements that you want to do, and it might be that you just can't offer the service there. But there are plenty of parts of the network where there are long sections. Anyway, um, two related questions. Um, so you talked about thousand people in a tra train, twenty coaches long. What happens when that tries to go around a roundabout? So what's that? What happens when a train, twenty coaches, tries to go around a roundabout? There will only be, ever be two coaches joined. So what I was saying was that a train, <coughs> you know, a choo-choo, yeah, has a thousand people, whereas this would be twenty individual coaches with fifty people on at three-minute intervals. Depending on destinations, then someone might have to need to hop onto a bus, wait for that to detach, then for that to attach to something else, and then switch onto that bus in order for them to get onto the bus that needs to go where they're going. It depends how good the programming is. Well. And, and, you know, but, but seriously, it, it, it depends on two things. How good the programming is and how many people are wanting to travel. If there are only 10 people in the country, want, I mean, a bit like Liftshire, if there are only 20 people wanting to make a journey on a particular day across the whole UK, you're never going to get any matches. If you've got, you know, it, it's, it's, it only works with volume. And this only works with volume. I'm not making any comments on how many... You know, you, you, all I'm saying is that this is something which is either big... Or it's nothing, because if it's not, and, and actually one of the conclusions was, when you've got a three, four, five, six lane motorway, i.e. the M25 uh, and the M, M3, uh, uh, M4, <coughs> M1, it works. But by the time you get to the A1 north of um, Peterborough, um, actually the volume of traffic, typically, if you start saying, well, I'm only interested in 20% of the drivers, people, because, you know, 80% of them are going to say, I want to drive. Um, you actually find that there aren't that many people. It's almost a system which works 
for very congested parts of the network. And I don't know, the simulation will, un will, will help understand how well it works. It's going to transfer all the load to the front, <coughs> front vehicles, front brakes, on braking. So you're going to be cooking, you know, you have to totally re-engineer the Because assuming that you're going to have a rigid enough thing that's going to survive a head-on impact or something. I just see it's an articulated person. vehicle. I mean, so basically, we're going to have a vote at the end of this. Talk to each other and vote it as a break. Well, well, yeah, but, but you, if the fact that they're physically joined uh, in a stable enough way to, to survive the impact is going to mean that that load will transfer straight to the front of the vehicle. Surely it's, it's no different to a bench yeah. It's not going to be able to. Yeah, but they're they one bus, aren't they? I think you know, these are mechanical engineering problems, and um, one if, if people, someone who can get a space rocket to land on a nearly on a drone ship can probably solve it. I mean, I, it, it's, this is not a situation I've been in before, but people who understand about mechanical engineering design generally say, 10 minutes, yeah, um, generally say this is solvable. If you can do in flight. It's solvable, but you don't control. If this was docking and trains, on a you know, much more controlled environment, mm. uh, and you use the train network as a, and you change the way that throughput was managed on the rail network, um, and you transfer passengers between lines, you might conceivably give up some roads and build more railway. But I can see how you can control the other variables. But there's other road users, and this is just the first accident that occurs with this. The I, for it will be in, in I agree. You must you must design a system that has no fatalities, no major injuries. Oh, yeah. so can't be done on okay, well you, you're not you're not employed. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to listen to detractors as well. And argue with me. Tell me why I'm wrong. Sorry. Tell me why I'm wrong. No, I, it, 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 honestly, it, it, I, I agree it has to happen. It doesn't happen to happen at 70 miles an hour. It happens to happen at the lowest legal speed limit that you're allowed to drive at a motorway. Probably you go into the slow lane amongst the lorries um, and do the sort of do it at 60 miles an hour. Anyway, sorry, and then, yeah. I think what will happen, somebody will just grab the software, which will basically gather information who wants to travel which way, how many people, because there is a part of this solution which is pretty easy to do. So it will just grab information, who wants to go, which way, at which hour, how many people, and stick it not to some fancy science fiction trains that will gather around and connect. You mean the things I'm talking about? Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting a negative you, vibe here. Look, listen to this. <laughs> if you could make it as simple as possible yeah. and just skip the hardware problem, connect this kind of software to, car, to cars with the size of a smart, a bit wider, so three people can see, can see it alongside, uh, this car will be driving, it will be like a fleet of a car, of cars, and they will all be driving automatically like the California Google cars. So whenever you'll be going to work, you'll just set it on your mobile app on your phone. I'm going from point A to point B, and it won't be a problem for me if I will be maybe driving a bit longer route just to grab somebody else on the way. It's not going to be my car, so the cost will be lesser. I won't have to drive this car, so I should be taking a nap or working or doing whatever. And it basically would solve the problem that you are looking for, so there will be less car. I won't have to drive, it's going to be cheaper, and it's going to be all fancy integrated and everything. Okay. Just do the and you will skip the main problem, coaches that need to connect and need to be safe. And if I'm traveling five, seven miles, it's probably not worth to jump into the feeder vehicle, drive something, then connect to the bigger one, I'm, jump into the I'd bigger one, then to another feeder vehicle, sure. which will drop me near my work. Sure. My, my figures are based on journeys of over 50 miles. Then it's not the one. This is the biggest one. problem. It travels about 50 miles that is making not enough space in the middle of the city because there is too much car. Or the cars that are swarming the city centers are mostly the car of people who are traveling like seven miles to work. I'm, I'm just looking at an interurban problem. Um, there is, there's a bigger subject of urban travel, which it, <laughs> I, I can't solve. I, I think there's some changes happening. But you, you were asking. Um, the only thing I was going to say is if you want to sort of like get people to use it instead of a train, like how would you? Because by the time you've got on a bus, um, even if you don't have to stop 
if you compare that to the time it takes a train, even with the train stopping, how, like, say Norwich to Sheffield, the train will probably still get there first. So what would be the incentive to use? Either price or timing. Because this will get to get me from Ipswich to Birmingham faster than by train, because there isn't a train line. Um, Norwich to Sheffield. Do you go to Peterborough? Yeah, mine comes And then York. No, it's direct. Okay. Okay. Um, you would generally be trying to do the things which the train doesn't do. You know, you wouldn't be trying to compete Norwich London. Anyone who hasn't spoken. Isn't the hardest problem with this that with a bus stop, it doesn't matter how late my connection is. Mm. With this, if your connection's late, you go to Sheffield. I agree. I agree. You've, you've got absolutely... This is the biggest worry. Um, on a bus, the problem is you get left at the bus stop. Yeah, with this one... The next bus is coming. With, 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 with this one, the problem if you miss your connection is you go somewhere else. <laughs> And I think, like, if you fall asleep on a train, you can miss your stop and end up. Yeah, I know, but that's your fault. Yeah. I mean, this would be the system's fault. So there's a question. In a sense, you've got a, an unpredictable packet routing network in which people are... Correct. Yeah. And you have to try and establish some sort of legal contract by which you can sell the journey. Correct. Without knowing if they're going to end up at their destination. You have to set a legal contract which you are confident you will be able to meet, even if you which have to... Which might not include... It, it will. You yeah, might have to pay for some taxes. I mean, the train, the train network doesn't. Know, doesn't the train network doesn't, doesn't always get you to your destination, does it? That's like they, they will guarantee they get you from A to B, but it doesn't matter how long it takes or how they get you there. It, that you, it, for the lower fares, you might eventually. say we'll get you there yeah. eventually. Yeah. For higher fare, the answer might be we'll shove you in an Uber if we need <laughs> like to. <a> taxi. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think the point is, I'm a computer scientist, I'm not a transport guy, and yes, I'm thinking of this as, 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 a, as a routing problem. You said earlier that um, if you have to build an infrastructure for a new sort of transport system, not to work. And all these new fancy buses, they're infrastructure, aren't they? No, they're not, they're devices. But it's a lot of money, it's a lot of investment. Whereas. That's why you need a rich person. Idea, which is a good one. Sorry? The, 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 you, you can That's either. important bit, and you can, there's, there's infrastructure which you can use in that system, which is buses, trains, everything else, which run on a fixed timetable now. But if you had a system which routed it intelligently, you could make the whole system more efficient in that way. Well, but I mean, but the, the point is, the railway network is where it is, and the road network generally doesn't work for shared tra travel um, because you have to duck in and out every town. Can I just say? Transferring passengers between vehicles, you can do in two ways. You can do docking, mobile docking, or you can build parkway stations into the motorway network beside the road. You can basically build a lay-by that you go off the road, stop, people get out, there's a waiting area, there's a toilet and cafe and whatever. They're like, well, but there's a bit more, they're, they're more like bus stations. But they're in useless places, that's the key. Well, I mean, that's the great key. But the point is, you put them. You put them where you want them. Where you want the interchange to happen. Where you want the interchange. Where you want the, where people want to end up, which is a great strength because then you can come into those sidings and exchange at places which are not congested. Yes. But if I was getting off of the bus stop, and I knew another bus which was going to take me to a place I want to go with the ride because I knew the routing system worked, then that would be fine. That'd be fine. And that's, there's no infrastructure there at all. That's like Uber running on buses. Okay. So who's investing in the project? <laughs> what, are, you, are you investing? <laughs> really caveat, yeah. I, mean, I think it's a really good idea. Um, one thing I'd really like to see is some concept art of the buses, which I'm surprised that you didn't have that in your presentation. I haven't got an artist. <laughs> Just even some scribbles would be great, because at the moment it's quite hard to visualize. Yeah. Um, the second thing, which I guess you're probably working on, would be to see some kind of simulation showing a map of England with a bunch of people in different cities and showing them going the traditional route and then via your route and the little dots moving to see how much quicker they get there. Um, but also I do agree with a couple of the guys that just said, you know, one way to test the idea could be to just buy a few coaches and 
just have people dropped off at lay buys and, and do it that way, that you know that would be a lot cheaper and you could prove that it actually worked. I, I, I do agree. There is a proof, you know, the idea of building some gravel, I mean, the park and ride sites were built with, were started by gravel car parks. The first park and ride site in Cambridge was gravel and a porter cabin. They then built a fancy thing when they proved that people were going to use it. And I agree, the static transfers as a method. But to my mind, the, the answer is, you know, what I want is a system which is as good as driving without having to drive and with you being able to sleep and read and rest. And I don't think you do that with static transfers, but it's a simulation that will... Yeah, come on. <laughs> You're only doing yourself in. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.